This is Who Makes a Podcast? Conversations with your favorite podcast hosts about who they are, the shows they make, and why they make them. I'm your host, Chris Cookley, and my guest today is Brian Hood. Brian is an audio engineer, business educator, entrepreneur, and host of the Six Figure Creative Podcast, where he helps creatives with advice, strategies, and interviews to build a stable income doing what they love. In this interview, we talk about making the content you enjoy consuming, identifying your ideal listener, rebranding and recovering after a long content break, how to find and nurture guests, adapting to losing a co-host, and so much more. Brian is a funny, smart, and very experienced podcast host with a lot of insight to offer on a variety of topics, including but not limited to podcasting, business, and systems. I greatly enjoyed meeting and speaking with Brian. There was a lot that I learned from this interview, and I know there is a ton of information for you as well. So now here is my conversation with Brian Hood. Brian, welcome to Who Makes a Podcast. Thanks for having me, my dude. I love the uh, I love the pre prepped intro stuff, man. That's that's a good stuff. Makes me feel it's like when you talk me out like that. Yeah, he's gonna... yeah. But yeah, I'm glad to be on here, man. Yeah, and I had to write your intro for you because you refused to send me one. So <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So like, here's the deal, man. <laughs> and we talked about this ahead of time. For for this is a good lesson for anyone who wants to podcast at some point. Don't put work on your guests. <laughs> Do it all for them. <laughs> I was invited on a podcast before where they put me through so much like pre-episode work that I that I went from agreeing to be on the podcast to where I was just like, I, I don't even have time to do this pre-episode stuff. Like it was so many tasks that I was supposed to do that I, it just turned me off to the podcast and I was, and I never went on the podcast. So like call it lazy, call it like focus things. Like uh, I, I just, um, I think it's a, it's a good practice to have whenever you can to do as much work for the, for the guests that you have on as possible so that they don't have to do anything but show up and record. Yeah. Yeah. That's something to, to take to heart for sure. So I've, I've been looking forward to this conversation, honestly, since I started my podcast back in November of 2021. I had the hopes that I would get you and your former co-host, Chris Graham, on my podcast to talk to me. Your podcast is one of the ones that I listen to pretty religiously, actually, every week since back when it was the six-figure home studio, when you were talking mostly about music business things. For my listeners who don't know you, would you mind telling me a little bit about yourself and where you're from originally and how you got to where you are right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this could go as long or as short as you want, man, because there's, there's a lot to it. I've <laughs> been in, at, in the in the music and business world for the last decade plus, I guess, 15 years with music and everything. But um, just long story short, I'll, I'll skip the boring bits and, and, and focus on the interesting bits. Born and raised in Alabama and uh, somehow made it out of what I call the trap, which is Alabama. And um, I went straight from high school to touring in a, in a band, a metal band of all things, which is never a good idea. Like skip college, um, parents were cool with it. And, uh, and we did, we, we toured 44 states and eight countries before I call it quits in, at the end of 2008. Wow. And January 2009 is when I opened up my studio in my parents' basement. And uh, another thing that's like, I don't know if that's the best move. That's what you're going to do for, your, <laughs> for a living. And, but th- my parents were supportive yet again of having, you know, screaming metal vocalists in my basement. It was a, like my whole niche back then was like heavy metal and metalcore and hardcore bands and stuff. And that was the kind of band we were. And, uh, and I just started my studio in my, in my parents' basement. And within the first year, uh, it was full time. I, I, I moved into a studio and I was, I was so young, so inexperienced. I had no real background. So the, uh, the landlord, the only reason he would let me actually rent the the facility out was that I paid six months of my rent in advance. <laughs> and uh, that was, and I'm off to the races from there. So that was like 2010. Um, I had my first six figure year as a freelancer in 2014. And then um, shortly after that launched the six figure home studio as a blog in 2015. And then the podcast in 2018. And that's that's been kind of my main focus is that whole brand for the past several years. And I have a, <laughs> I have a bunch of side things like software companies and, and, you know, things that I don't, talk about elsewhere most of the time, but, uh, the podcast ties into all these things. So I think it's that part will be relevant to your audience. Yeah. Would you say that you're addicted to starting businesses? <laughs> yeah. So that was another thing is I, uh, in third grade, my, my teacher tried to put like get the doctor to put me on, um, Ritalin for ADHD. Cause I was like super hyperactive. <laughs> 
<laughs> short attention span, you know, and instead of that, my parents pulled me out and homeschooled me for a few years until I got my act together. But, um, I would say I still have entrepreneur ADHD. I can't, I can't have hobbies. I tend to monetize all my hobbies or fun things. Yeah. So, and, and it's just, I don't know, it's a fun game and I keep loving to play it. And it's to my own detriment sometimes because there is so much, only so much focus you can give something when you have like three or four or five different things you're doing at the same time. But uh, I always say, and I don't follow my own advice, that you can build one thing, you can maintain one or two others, and then everything else you have going on is going to kind of slowly taper off and eventually die, uh, especially if you don't give it attention for long enough. But that's kind of been the case for for me for years. I've just, with every six years or so, I'm doing something completely different. Yeah. So uh, we're definitely going to get back to the podcast because that's you know the the point of this podcast. But I'm curious for myself. You have you have the six figure creative, which is a podcast, but also a business. You have Good Fortune Media, which is a podcast production company. You have mm -hmm. File Pass. Is that it? Yep. Do I have more? Are you asking if I have more? Yeah, I have more. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I know you. I know um, you did real estate investing at one point. What, what else? What else do you have going on that you are actively? an owner of or manager of that's a business. Yeah. So I also have easyfunnels.io, which is my website builder yes. for recording studios. So it's like a Squarespace and Wix competitor with a lot of functionality built in um, for studios specifically, but eventually kind of broadening out to just the freelancers in, in general. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of stuff. All right. We can, we can edit this bit out, but I'm curious why, uh, why is six figure creative not built on easy funnels? Oh, so the reason it's not built on easy funnels is because not every, not every type of website is for easy funnels. That's the, the power of niching down. Gotcha. If you are trying to create a content empire, easy funnels is not your website <laughs> platform. <laughs> if you're trying to sell your audio services or any sort of freelancer services, easy funnels is your platform. So I use easy funnels for good fortune media. I use it for four five, six recordings, my, my mixing studio, and I use it for easy funnels, it, the site itself. And I use it for file pass actually, but six figure creative and the six figure home studio are built on WordPress, which is kind of the, the golden standard for content. And if you're a podcaster, yeah. you can get away with using something like easy funnels or wix or squarespace but honestly like the power of something like wordpress it, it's more technical it's 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 a lot more of a headache there's updates and plugins and you just have to be able to you, you have to be able to fit fo figure it the fuck out and if you can't figure it the fuck out then you can't use wordpress that's basically the rule but if you can figure it the fuck out fit fo as i call it then <laughs> be my guest wordpress is awesome yeah and my website who makes a podcast is also built on wordpress and i think i've heard that you use elementor as your page builder and I, yep. I do as well. So Elementor is pretty fantastic. All right. So you started uh, Six Figure Creative as a, or Six Figure Home Studio as a blog. And then eventually the podcast came along. So why, why start the podcast? What was it about the podcasting that kind of drew you in that made you want to do that? It was a medium that I saw myself being able to put out regular content. So in 2014, I put my first blog article out. Uh, so it was actually, I said 2015, I think it was actually 2014 when I put my first blog article out on the Six Figure Home Studio. And it was basically, and this is a, a really good idea for anyone launching a new platform, new content platform, whether it's a podcast or whether it's a blog or whether it's a YouTube channel, the first video or the first podcast episode, or in this case, the first blog article was the why behind me launching the blog. It was me talking through all of the pain points I'd seen, all the lessons I had learned as a business owner to my, on my path to six figures and what I wanted to talk about on the, on the blog itself. And then I just had sign up to our, our email list if you want to get future articles from this blog. And within the end of the week, I had over 2000 email addresses on that email list from my first wow. blog post in 2014. And so I was off to the races. And the problem was I am such a slow writer. I'd put out these like, I'm a perfectionist as well. So I put out these mammoth, like two to 4,000 word articles. They would all bring in 500 to a thousand email addresses, but it would it would be like one a month at most, or sometimes just a, like a few a year. Yeah. And so by the time I got to 20, end of 2017, early 2018, I was releasing my first course, but I had no standard like weekly content marketing practice. It was just like when I got an article out, it would come out and podcasting was something that I had really latched onto as a listener. I, I've been listening to podcasts religiously since 2014, 2013, probably even. And that was the content that I loved consuming. And I never read blogs. I never really watched YouTube videos. So why not produce the thing that you, cr that you consume? Yeah. And so when I launched the podcast, I just saw it being a much easier path. Cause, and it, and it was, and it has been like, it's about if we're doing content episodes, it might be 30 to 45 minutes of planning. And then however long it takes to record the episode, 30 to 45 minutes. And then we pass it off to our team and they edit it 
and then I'll do quality control and I'm done. And so it's like a couple hours where I, I had actually timed myself on an article that was like three or 4,000 words. And that was like 30 hours to write and edit that yeah. and review that and re rewrite, re edit. Yeah. I'm so slow with that. So that was the main driving factor was I wanted consistent content and I never had it until we launched the podcast. Yeah, definitely quicker to speak than it is to type for most people. I want to go back to the email signups that you got because that is like, are you aware of, of how much of an anomaly that is that you would put out oh, yes. one article yes. and get thousands of emails and then continually get thousands or hundreds of emails for every article that you put out? Do you have any insight into why that happened or what you were doing that drew those kinds of eyeballs? Yeah, there's uh, there's a couple of factors that you will not be able to replicate, and there are some factors you can replicate. The, the unreplicatable factors were this was 2014, and this is when things could go viral on Facebook. So you could post an article, and we get th that article got like thousands of shares, and that yep. drove tens of thousands of people to the website, and a small percentage of them signed up. I didn't have a lead magnet or anything, but they signed up on the idea that I was pitching them essentially. So that you can't really replicate that now. You can do paid media around that, but it's going to get usually less, lesser quality people to your email list, which is still fine because you can get a, get on your list at scale. And I've spent hundreds of thousands on on list building and straight sales stuff on on Facebook and Instagram ads. But uh, the replicatable parts that you can do are what I talked about, where it was, I was basically pitching the vision of what I was creating and my story personally tied into that so well, because I had already accomplished a thing that a lot of people wanted to accomplish, which was earning six figures in a home studio, which is where I got the name. It's not a great uh -huh. name. It kind of sounds scammy, but people love the idea. And no one at the time was, I don't think there's many, many people even to, the, to this day talking about the business of running recording studios or home studios, at least not exclusively. Some people, they have podcasts where they talk about it sometimes, or they'll have guests on where that conversation is kind of brought up, or you'll have a few people in the audio space selling courses for um, learning how to produce music or mix music. And then they'll have like a module or a video or something on the business side, but no one was dedicated mm -hmm. to it. So it really was like a blue, a, like the bluest ocean on earth at the time paired with the virality of Facebook at the time was like the perfect storm of getting that many email addresses. So by the end of that first year, I was over 10,000 uh, people on my email list. Wow. Yeah. Right place, right time for sure. That, I mean, that's just, that's incredible. That's, <laughs> I think anybody in, in 2022 who's trying to get started uh, would love to have that kind of organic growth. And yeah, because Facebook's changed and it's pay to play on there now, it's probably just not going to happen for, on that platform, at least maybe, maybe, TikTok's the way to go for that. I don't know. Yeah, we do have a TikTok account and maybe you want to talk about that as well because the only content we post on there are short clips from our episodes. And um, we had a lot of success with it end of last year and then it slowed down significantly this year, but we're around 13 or 14,000 followers on there. And that's all organic and it's all um, you know hands off for me because I have somebody who does that for me. But it, it is a way to grow organically in today's age, but it's still not the same as what yeah. it was like the good old days, as I call it. Like if I knew what I knew now as a business owner back then, I would be so much further along today because yeah. I would have doubled down on everything. The TikTok thing's interesting. How are you converting those followers into customers? What like, do you have a, a roadmap for that? Is there a... No. No, no, that, that's the, that's no. the black okay. box right there. That's the, that's the million dollar gotcha. question because I'm still not a hundred percent bullish on TikTok for what we're doing and what I pay our guy to do that. The numbers, in my opinion, probably haven't really added up, but it's, it's kind of one of those, like, I'm willing to place a bet and I'm willing to pay that much money as a bet to see, because it's a mere fraction of what I would typically spend on in a month on, on something like Facebook or Instagram ads. And and the organic growth is great. So I know we get listeners and followers from that. We don't have like mm -hmm. specific funnels set up because our, our whole MO is just growth. And we, we still want to get it a bit bigger before we really start trying to push to funnels or being a listener on the podcast or, you know, places where it's more measurable. So you're not really pushing a lead magnet right now. No. And it, and, and I've seen people being able to successfully do it, but they usually have much larger followings. And so it's like a, it's a numbers game when you have a big enough following, you can, get a tiny percentage of them to, to take an action. And if, if your funnel's great, you can convert it on a high level, you know, a big, a nice high earnings per lead. But I don't think we have the following for that. Like 13,000 is a drop in the bucket in TikTok terms. So yeah, we'll see where it goes and we'll probably give it the rest of the year. And if we haven't seen what we want to see, then maybe we pull back. Cool. Do you listen to a lot of podcasts these days? Do you have time for that? 
Oh yeah. So part of my like health regimen, go to the gym every day at around 6am with a, a gym buddy of mine, who's basically like a personal trainer at this point. Yeah. He's like the, the Greek God body type. And, uh, I just do whatever he says. It's a nice friend to have. Yeah. Very good friend to have. Like without him, I would be a fat slob. <laughs> and like, honestly, I am, uh, unhealthily tied to, to him being there with me to show up. Like it's, it's, it's great. It's been that way for like a decade. So whatever. Uh, <laughs> but the, along with that, something I started this year was uh, 10,000 steps a day on average. So I do at least 10,000 steps a day. I try to do more than that because like sometimes on like a Saturday, I might only get six or 7,000 and I try to make up for it. But 10,000 steps a day, that usually takes me about an hour of walking. I think maybe, maybe a little less than that. And, and that's when I listen to podcasts. Do you know what that converts to in miles roughly? Yeah, it's like five or six miles, something like that. I think I, okay. I don't know exactly. I just have the pedometer thing and follow that on my on my app and on my uh, Apple Watch. And uh, I'll do th usually three to four walks a day in in fifteen to twenty minute increments. And that's my podcast time. So I call it my podcast walk. And so I am uh, keeping my body healthy and keeping my mind sharp. And so I can usually get through in an hour. I can get through at least two or three episodes of a podcast, depending on how long and depending on how fast I listen to the episode. And, and uh, who are you listening to? What are your what are your go to podcasts? Yeah, I'll pull up the list right now. They're all guests you should get on the podcast if you can. Uh, so the ones that are on the top of my list here is um, the game. Uh, it's by Alex Ramosi, incredible entrepreneur. Like he put out a book called Hundred Million Dollar Offers. Anyone who has something they're selling should read that book and then listen to his podcast. Uh, the Graham Cochran Show, I listen to that regularly. A couple episodes here or there I might skip because sometimes it's not relevant to my business model. You've had him on the podcast. Awesome dude. He's been on our podcast a few, yeah, like great. four times at this point. He's, 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 he's awesome. Um, the Art of Online Business with Rick Mulready uh, and Mind Your Business Podcast by James Wedmore. Those are like yep. some, of my, some of my regulars. And then I'll sometimes binge through Marketing Secrets by Russell Brunson. Nice. So mostly business related podcasts. That seems oh, to be the world. Oh, one hundred percent business related. Yeah, that's all I listen to. No, no serial or S Town. Oh, or... I do listen to a true crime podcast. No, I listen to a true crime podcast called um, Sean Atwood's True Crime Podcast because there's a series on there I've been listening to of a guy who escaped from a, a Thai prison, and it's like a thirteen part series. And so, like when I'm traveling or when I'm doing something that I, it's not work mode, that might be the podcast that I could have been to. So I'm like I'm on like part seven right now, and they're like three to four hours. <laughs> So it's like the longest series of wow. all time, but it's an incredible storyteller. <laughs> but that's the only non-business podcast I've, I've listened to in the past like two years. Yeah. Hey, it's Chris. Can I jump in here for a minute and ask if you have thought about making your own podcast? If you have, you may have realized there's a lot more that goes into it than you might have thought. Don't worry. I have a gift for you. I want you to have my podcast quick start checklist. From what microphone and recording software you should use to how you host and distribute your show, I'm here to help with all of that and more. My podcast quick start checklist will walk you through everything you need to know to start your podcast. I'll show you what's actually important. To get my podcast quick start checklist, go to whomakesapodcast.com slash start and tell me where to send it. Now let's get back to the episode. What is it about podcasts that you think people find attractive? What, what, what is it about the medium that is drawing so many listeners in? There's a few things. The first is in no other medium can you multitask. You can't, I mean, I mean you technically could on YouTube, but you, most of the time you are sitting in a chair watching it or you're sitting on your phone watching it. With blog articles, you cannot multitask, like by definition you're reading, so there's no way to do that. Audio is one of the, the only ways that I've seen that I can be doing something else while also learning or being entertained. So that's a huge factor for it. Like I'll be doing dishes, doing chores, walking, driving, long drives, podcasts are there for me. And then um, another reason is you just have such a connection with the person, similar to YouTube, because YouTube is like very personality driven. You get connected with the person, you trust that person. You, you almost want like, someone to curate things for you. So I think in a lot of these podcasts that I'm addicted to are people that curate really cool, interesting guests. They may not be big names. They may not be somebody you've ever heard of, but they have some cool thing that they've done that they're bringing to you. 
so that's, that's some of the reasons that I love podcasts and you just, you get to know these people and I, and I've experienced this myself as podcasts that I've listened to, like, uh, the bigger pockets podcast was a, a one that I I've been through before. And, uh, like you get to know those people and then you meet them in real life and you're like, it's weird. Cause I know so much about you, but you have no idea who yeah. I am. And I've had that same experience. People who are like, who listen to my podcast are like, I know so much about you, Brian. I, I was there when you got married. I was there when you got on your honeymoon, <laughs> like, you yeah. know, like, and, cause I've talked through my life stuff, you know, as I'm doing the podcast, that's kind of one of the things that Chris and I had done, which is like bantering before the episode. Yeah. Terrible for, for like new listeners. But if you were trying to build a quality audience that loves you, it's so important that you have that sort of stuff on your podcast. And so just talking about your personal stuff. So if you do that, well, you can build loyal listeners and followers who feel like they know you, they trust you. And that's a huge part of having a successful podcast, especially if you're trying to tie a business to it. I mean, that's, that's the situation that we're in, right? Like I ask you to come on this podcast with me and I know way more about you than you know about me. I'm sure that I, I didn't even exist to you before I sent you a couple of emails and uh, reached out to you through your website. But yeah, I was, I was there with you when you went on your honeymoon to Thailand and you got married and you just got back from Cancun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Um, it's, it's just a little bit creepy, but uh, it, it, it's fun. <laughs> It's, yeah, if, you, if that makes you feel uncomfortable, then a podcast may not be, be the best thing for you. <laughs> not you specifically, Chris, but like who, anyone listening right now. Well, the, I guess the good thing is that if you don't have a video version, somebody's really got to try to know what you look like. So like you, your, your chances of getting spotted walking down the street are maybe a little bit less than if you were a YouTube star. That's true. Yeah. I like where I'm at with it. I don't, I don't want to be recognized in a creepy way where people freak out like a, like a big YouTuber might. But like, I like when I'm at a trade show of some sort where it's very niche, like people recognize and know who I am. And if not by face, then at least by the, the yeah. brand that I've created. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you have a certain show or host that you look up to or try to emulate on your show? Hmm. It's been different podcasts at different times. Um, I, I think it's impossible not to to do that to an extent if you listen to as many podcasts as I do. And yeah. especially when we started out, like when we started out, there were like a few podcasts that I just replicated segments and 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 flows of shows and intros and outros and things like that. Smart Passive Income was another big one that I was influenced heavily by yeah. with Pat Flynn. And and over time, we've just kind of found our own voice. We found our own methods. And so this day, not so much anymore, but you know, no one's doing anything that I've, I've seen in the business space that groundbreaking. It's usually they either have a topic they're talking about or they have a guest they're bringing on. And sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's not. The guests are really what make the shows on the ones that I listen to. But yeah, there's nothing like, I can't think of the last time that I was just like, oh, I've got to do that on the podcast. You kind of have it figured out at this point. Oh I mean, yeah, we're, I mean, we're almost 200 episodes in. By the time this episode airs, I'll be well yeah. past the 200 episode part. So I, I have... We've definitely systemized it to a point where it's a, a pretty well old machine. That doesn't mean we're not going to change things. And, and honestly, by the time this episode comes out, we may have changed things up significantly because I've, I've had discussions around changing up the show format, um, things we've got planned in the pipeline. So it's, it could be different, but for now, it's a well oiled machine until we decide to let Brian's ADHD brain take over and shake things up <laughs> to where it's no longer a well oiled machine. I do something like that with websites. Like I'll, I'll build a website for something and then you know, a month or two later, I'm like, I, don't, I don't like this. I got to tear it down and rebuild the whole thing. Even though like it hasn't accomplished anything yet. Nobody's seen it. Like it's just me looking at it and I get bored with it. I'm like, I got to do it again. I got to do it different. Do you have an ideal listener for your podcast? Do you have somebody that you would love to be a listener? How do you, how do you identify who you're making the show for? Yeah. So it, it's really easy if you are your, if you are your ideal listener, like the old you, like so me 10, 15 years ago, where I was, what I was struggling with, what I was identifying as, what I was wanting to accomplish before I actually accomplished it. Like I can just speak to myself. Now that's not going to cover everybody. And, and so predominantly the six figure home studio has been almost all male, 97% male listeners, probably higher than that, like 97, 98, but I'm just going by what metrics I can see on, on different social platforms that tell us our uh, gender breakdown and home studio owners are all pretty much like the same type of person. Like it's, we've up to the, up, up, up to episode 150, we, we accumulated a very uh, good following of clones. <laughs> and, and there's some pros and cons to that. Like you hit a growth cap. Uh, there's not a lot of diversity in your audience. Like there's a lot of things that we 
yep. want to change and have been trying to change significantly since episode 150. And episode 150, for anyone not who doesn't f- know anything about me, was when we rebranded from the Six Figure Home Studio to the Six Figure Creative. When we did that rebrand, we actually kept the same podcast feed because we had thousands of subscribers, maybe tens of thousands of subscribers that we wanted to carry over to the new show. It wasn't such a big change where that was going to be like a traumatic change. It wasn't like we were going from a business podcast to an entertainment podcast or to a, um, a pets focused podcast or like something crazy. It was like, we were going from the very narrow niche, which is home studios or recording studio businesses to a little bit broader niche, but it's still a niche, which is the creative freelance business owners photographers, videographers, graphic designers. And in that world, we have a a bit different type of audience we're trying to to capture. A lot of that is female focused. So a lot of the guests we bring on are are females because we don't have that perspective. I I, I don't know how to really like my personality type. I'm type. I'm very driven. I'm an Enneagram eight for anyone who knows what that is. Like I am, I am brash. I am like very matter of fact. I'm not extremely nice, but I'm like, no nonsense. And that's attractive to certain people. And it's very repelling to other people. So I may be fighting an uphill battle trying to attract a female audience because my personality typically does not, is not attractive to a female when it comes to like learning because, and, and maybe I'm like completely off here, but I just think about my wife as an avatar and what she would want to listen to. And I am not, it. <laughs> she wants somebody who's like going to be her cheerleader. Is going to like egg her, like say she can, you can do it. You can like, and, uh, and, but we have guests who come on and are great at that. And yeah. they're excellent at having that sort of spirit and that sort of encouraging like approach. And, and so that's, that's kind of what we're doing is, is building up the other followers that we haven't had as a, as a specifically recording studio, audio engineering focused audience. Have you seen that change in your audience? Have have you been able to track that at all? Yeah, so it's 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 much different. So looking on TikTok, for example, uh, like twenty five percent of our followers are female, which is <laughs> that's like a ten x increase of what we had before. Yeah, yeah so it's significant. It's still not going to like tip the, the scales one way or another unless I got a female co host. That might help a lot on that. But uh, but it's growing on that on that regard. This year is going to be a. a it's like the biblical wandering in the desert for a while, like 40 years in the desert yeah. where you're kind of like lost in the wilderness. <laughs> I feel like this year is going to be a much of very much a learning year. We're still growing, but it's, it's much slower. And I kind of expected that because we're, we're trying to like figure out what our audience is now and, and how we attract them. And, and I have a lot of thoughts on that and a lot of plans for that. And a lot of things around paid ads that I'm going to do with that. But it, we haven't, I, we haven't really latched onto any audience that's like field growth a thousand percent. And that's the negative when you're not super, super laser focused niche, which we were with the recording studio world. It was so easy to refer us to any home studio owner. But now with the six figure creative, it's like, there are podcasts. There's a podcast called the six figure photography. And that's uh, Ben Hartley. He's actually been on our podcast before. Incredibly smart, uh, talented business owner. And so if you're a photographer, you're probably gonna listen to that, you know, and there's not, you know, there's some un, in the design world or videography world. So it's going to be a, probably a slower growth, but at the same time, each one of those niches is 10 times the size of the audio engineering niche. So like, we don't have to have the same percentage of market share in these other, these other, uh, demographics because they're so much bigger than what we had. So we kind of saturated the world. We grew to the extent we could in the, the niche that we were in and it was time to broaden out. So still trying to navigate that. You took a lot of time off between the rebrand, between episodes that were released. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't have the, the episodes pulled up. I don't, eight months, I don't know how, eight how months. many months, eight months. Okay. I, I'm thinking in, in the context of like somebody who makes videos on YouTube, there's all sorts of pressure that they feel or pressure that YouTube puts on them or their subscribers put on them, or maybe it's, maybe it's all in their head to constantly be cranking out content and a podcast is somewhat similar. Did you feel any of that pressure? Like as the months started to rack up, were you ever like, this is just, it's taken too long and we're just never going to get back to it. Every fucking month. Like I felt the pressure of that so much. So we can get into the weeds of this if you want, but it was a lot of my co-host that, (laughs) that slowed us down those months. There's a long story there that I'm not going to necessarily get into, but I'll say this in, in the YouTube world, there is a lot of validity to that pressure because that is very much an algorithm driven growth yeah. world. And the algorithm will drop you. Yes. So if you stop putting out content all of a sudden, YouTube's probably not going to promote your channel because their entire thing is they want people on the platform watching ads. And that's why you see like some of the biggest channels on YouTube right now are like, are the fastest growing ones are all gaming channels. 
because they can put out content every week and it'll be 30, 45 minute videos playing through a video game of some sort. And the retention grass on those YouTubers will be like super high. People will finish these really long videos. And so YouTube just promotes the hell out of those people. Whereas like somebody who's putting out 10, 15 minute videos, maybe won't have the same watch time. So they won't get that same sort of promotion on YouTube's homepage. But either way, if you stop putting out content, people are not going to be giving you watch time. So YouTube's not going to be promoting your stuff on the homepage or on the recommended videos. Now in the podcast world, it's not the same. We don't have that algorithm engine, at least not yet. Spotify is kind of starting to get there finally. So we have some sort of algorithm recommending our podcast, which is like the first I've seen of this on any platform. I'm surprised Apple hasn't done this yet, but with that means we don't necessarily have the algorithmic pressure, but we definitely have the pressure of an audience who wants our content. And when you go for that long without releasing something, you lose so much momentum. You lose so much, um, rhythm. You lose the ability to like, you just get rusty. Yeah. So it was, it was a long, awful year of not putting out content. And when we came back, we came back strong. Cause that, for, that coming back from that was our most downloaded episode we've ever had. But yeah, it's like, it was awful. I mean, we can go into that as if you want, but it was, uh, I would not recommend that for anybody. Did you record episodes during that time period that just never made it up or was it just completely, we're just, we're just not recording anything. Yeah. So just for the, for the record, episode zero through 150 of our podcast was mostly me and my co-host talking about topics. So we'd plan a topic, we teach and we were done. Yeah. We only had like maybe five to 10 interviews in that entire backlog. So we didn't really have a system around guest acquisition, guest nurturing, guest booking, interview like outline. We didn't have any of that figured out because we had done so few interviews. And then when we shifted to 150, we felt like we had stagnated from a content perspective and we wanted to shift to interviews. And that was part of the rebrand for six figure creative was shifting more predominantly to interview focus because we wanted these other people bringing in their ideas and their thoughts and their skills and their approaches to life and business and, and everything. And the problem with that is we had to build all these things out. How do I identify these guests? How do we vet them? How do we reach out to them? What do we say to them? How do we book them? How do we nurture them? How do we get them? How do we follow up with them until they book? All these things are things you have to think about. It's just a sales funnel, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. It's like all the same stuff. And we had to build it out. And, and, and then for us specifically, like, because I was handling pretty much everything for our podcast, that was something I kind of put into my co-host hands to get done. And it just never got done and it dragged out and excuses and whatever. So you know, it's like the reason we didn't put it out as fast as we planned was because of that sort of struggle between my co-host and I. But other than that, it shouldn't have taken that long. Two months max for like a complete rebrand mm -hmm. overhaul of the type of show, the format, what we're doing, getting guests in there. And to this day, we finally have like a really good process down for getting guests on the show. And, uh, and we're still tweaking it, still perfecting it. It's still not a perfect process, but it's something that we can, I can now actually have someone doing it for me versus me doing all the work. Would you be able to speak to that a little bit for anybody who may be listening, who does an interview show, who would like to learn what you have learned as far as a guest podcast uh, experience is? What, what are some of the big lessons and takeaways that you've got from putting that process together? I, I look at it just like any business, which is for anyone who's not familiar with what a funnel is, you have top of funnel, which is like, how has someone become aware of your business? Middle of funnel, like how do you nurture them until they're ready to buy? And then bottom of funnel is how do you convert them to a paying customer? That's like a basic uh, sales funnel in a nutshell. So it looks different for every business, but like for me, if I have courses, how do they find out about the course? How do they learn more about the course and how do they stay does that course stay top of mind until they're ready to buy it? And then when they finally buy it, um, what's the process for that? Anyways, it's the same for guests. How is the guest going to become aware of your podcast or how are you going to become aware of the guest itself? Cause there's kind of two sides of the coin there. So top is a guest identification, like finding the guest. And then how are you going to actually reach out and, and nurture, meaning like follow up with them until they actually book with you? Cause that can take months sometimes. Like for you, you, your first email to me, was like last year and it's, yeah, it's like almost summer it's 2022 May. and, and I'm just now on your podcast. It's May, 2022. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's a long process from first outreach to booking sometimes. Um, and then when they book, like, what's the process for scheduling, for reminding them, for following up? And then the schedule, for, how do you, do, so, so really quickly, I'll talk a little bit about our process. First of all, we're in ClickUp. ClickUp.com, I think is the, the website. It is a project management app. It's, I've tried is so many of them. And this is the one we finally landed on is the, the thing that we want to 
to build our entire business off of. We have so much in there at this point, but we have all the processes, all the checklists are in there for each single, every single step of this process. So if I pass this off to a brand new person, go get us a guest for the podcast. They can literally go into ClickUp. I create an account. I assign the task to them and every single step and every single instruction is inside of that so that they can do it. That's how like, that's how stupid simple we have to make the process to make it so that I'm not dependent on one single person. There's an, there's like a business adage, uh, two is one and one is none for redundancy. So like yep. if you're depending on one person, you might as well be depending on nobody. <laughs> we have different ways that we identify guests for our podcast. So what are the sources? What's the traffic? In, in other words, in a funnel, we have other podcasts that we review regularly that have our ideal guests on it. We have um, referrals. So every single interview that we do at the end of the interview, we ask for refer referrals for our podcast. Like, do you know of any other guests that match this kind of what we're looking for or what you do or any people that are clones of you is kind of how we ask it. And then we have uh, a form on our website where people can either suggest guests or they can apply as a guest on our podcast. And then there are some other, what I'd call fishing holes where our guests hang out or we can kind of identify guests that we want to have on the podcast. But um, our number one right now is actually other podcasts because we don't want to get a guest on the podcast who is successful, but cannot communicate verbally. Like they, they're either super mm -hmm. monotone or boring, or they have a, like a, um, they just can't communicate ideas or sometimes like they're re really smart and they can communicate ideas, but their English is not the first language and the accent is so thick that it's difficult to understand. So these are all things that if they're on another podcast, we can hear that before we ever have to, before we ever like get them on our list. So once that we, we get to a few, like what we call qualification criteria, like, do they have this, this, and this, like a few things that we call like pre-qualification that go on our potential guest list for me to approve. And then I go through that list once a month and I, I check off the ones that I want to have on the podcast because I still have final say. So of who's going to come on the podcast, our team is the one who actually f identifies these people kind of first go around and they'll put notes and they have a lot of things that give me ideas of whether or not I want them on the podcast clips to other episodes they've been on so I can listen to them, um, potential angles for the show. So like if they're a marketing expert, or if they're a sales expert, or if they're, you know, they use some sort of content marketing to get clients as a freelancer, these are all things that I want to know because we can have a whole episode built around that. Yep. And once I approve them, then we have a process we put people through to reach out to them, to nurture them, to follow up until they book. And uh, we have everything down to the, like a specific URL they go to, to show up for the podcast. Like we have a, a plain, pretty URL they can go to. I, I could give it out now, but it's a public URL. I don't want people going there and showing <laughs> up in our Riverside room for, for episodes, but we have a well-oiled machine around that. And then after the fact, when the episode's done, my assistant gets a ping in Slack automatically via like Zapier automations. And he goes to town on the edit and, and my TikTok guy gets the episode and starts doing his stuff. And so again, it's just a well-oiled machine. And on an interview podcast, like this, that whole guest acquisition process, the like three-step funnel, which is acquisition, nurturing and, and booking or sales in that case is uh, incredibly important. And then we do some stuff around like when the episode's done and live, we create some assets, we send it to the guests so they can post it on their social media. So we get promotion from that to remind them the episode's live. That doesn't always happen, but it's just nice and easy to give them content so they can post it and they don't have to create stuff for themselves. Kind of going back to the beginning of this episode where I talked about take all the work off your potential guests and do it all for them. Yeah. That's what we try to do so that they're not the ones struggling to come up with content for the social media channels. Cause everyone wants to put out content these days on social media, wherever they are. And if you create the clips and the imagery and stuff for them, it's you're that much more likely for them to promote the episode that you interview them on, which is part of our growth strategy. And how are you having your team reach out to these guests? Is it primarily through email or are you going to the podcast that they've been on and been, be like, Hey, can, can you introduce me? Depends. If I know the, if I know the podcast host, sometimes we might do that, but honestly, like, we, we have a good enough script to where like we get at least 50% of people reply to us. And then we'll, I think our numbers right now are like 25% of people reach out to end up booking on the show. That's kind of our funnel metrics. I could be a little bit off here, but that's kind of at least top of top of mind for me is where it's at. So if we have a common connection, that's one of the criteria we do. Like we have a, we have a specific email template that if there is a common connection, I can say, Hey, just saw that you were interviewed on so-and-so's podcast. He's a great friend of ours and he's been on our podcast. I would love if you'd come on our show to talk about blank, blank, and blank, 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 or blank or whatever. That's kind of the, the thing. Is this something you'd be interested in? Just open it to yes or no question. Not like, here's the link to book and all this stuff. It's just like, get a response. Mm -hmm. And then um, if they reply, then we just have the process from there. We have templates. We have created pre-programmed so they can go book through our uh, Calendly link. 
And then if they don't, then we have a follow-up process from that, from templates. All of this is done from ClickUp. So ClickUp, you can actually email from the task itself oh, in the nice. comments area. This is what we love it so much. So yeah. my assistant can actually be in there and email as me and send templates as me from my email address. The replies get pulled into ClickUp in the task. So there's a whole conversation history in the comment for the specific task, which is get this guest on our podcast. So all that information is in one area, all the email templates, all the conversation history, all the notes that we need to know in order to get the guest on. So I can review what my team is doing at any point and see this person has not responded in like six months and you haven't followed up with what happened, you know? Um, <laughs> but there's also automations in place via ClickUp that when we send out an email, there's automatically added a follow-up task so that if they haven't responded in however many days or weeks, then we're going to automatically reach back out to them. And so it'll show up in my team's inbox as a to-do list that day that they need to follow up with guest X, Y, or Z. And then they can follow up using one of our templates. That, I mean, that sounds like an awesome tool. I'm, I'm using Notion to manage my podcast and I have a lot of that stuff kind of set up, but there's, there's like no automations in it. Right. So it's all, it's all just me kind of manually going in and checking boxes and, and I contacted you on this date. And for anybody who's wondering, I initially reached out to Brian November 18th of 2021. That was my first contact. So here, here we are in May. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> but no, no, it's it's all good, man. That was before I even had an episode out. So ClickUp sounds fantastic. That would that would definitely help with getting guests on the show. How far in advance are you recording the episodes that come out? Like how like how, how long is the guest waiting before their episode comes out? So side side note, I was looking at the calendar for that exact day. I had uh, a call with a coaching client and two interviews to do that day, which is why you probably didn't get a response from me. <laughs> I'm looking at my calendar and it was two days after my birthday, but, um, I would love to be a month or more in advance, but right now it's like week to week because we're going through a guest, a uh, 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 co-host transition. Like we'll probably talk about this a bit, but like I've had a co-host for like 175 episodes and kind of transition him out. It's, it's a struggle to like, to keep things moving along and, and navigate that. And then also like a lot of these systems were finally setting up these processes in place to where someone else can run it. Cause I wanted, I'm transitioning my assistant into more of an operations manager role. Mm -hmm. So part of this is slowing down the, the, the progress of the podcast, but typically like three or four months in advance would be ideal. I mean, I'm sorry, three or four episodes in advance would be ideal, especially as we grow the team more and we get a copywriter and we get some help around that where you, you don't want to just dump it on their desk you know, the week before or the day before the episode comes live. So for example, like the episode that comes out tomorrow for our podcast was recorded Friday. So like, that's definitely not ideal for yeah. any situation, but we've gone anywhere from like week to week. And we've gone to like where we've been two months in advance. So we, we have the, the, the process in place now where we, we have guest pipeline full enough to where we'll start getting caught back up. But I was also in Cancun for, uh, two weeks recently. So that, that dried up our pipeline, which is why we're week to week now. I mean, who could blame you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the Friday to Tuesday, that uh, four-day gap, is that the, the closest it's been to deliver an episode? To me, the deadline is Friday. If we don't have an episode recorded by Friday, we're going to do, do a replay episode. Yeah, well, I mean, that's good that you have that, that option for sure. That, that definitely helps. Let's talk about Chris for just a minute. So you worked with a co-host, Chris Graham, for, as you said, the, the majority of the podcast that's been there. And we don't need to necessarily get into why he's leaving, but... What are the biggest advantages that you had with having a co-host and how do you see things kind of moving forward now that he's not part of the podcast? Man, there's so many advantages to having a co-host. Like when you're first starting a podcast by yourself, it's, it's like kind of scary. It's kind of lonely and it's really hard to have chemistry as a solo podcaster. And like, and so just for you, Chris, like you in our episode so far, you haven't said a single thing about yourself. So when we're talking about like yeah. building followers that know you, that like you, that trust you, that's not the true. listeners that's don't know who true. you are. No, nope, I told you about Notion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to, that's going to do it. And, and, and even like, you even had a story before this episode, you were just talking about how like your neighbor's tree fell on your power. And now like you didn't have power and you got all your lights off because, um, now there's like an electricity smell in your house and it's kind of terrifying. Like yeah. this is all stuff that's like great banter for building that personal following. And so when you have a co-host that you see every single week, you just naturally build a relationship and a friendship with each other that permeates through the podcast. And so I think a lot of listeners listen to every single week because they love the relationship that Chris and I had. And so the, the benefits of this are that you have a shoulder to lean on, on mic. Um, if you have a good co-host, you have banter, you have that 
relationship, you have someone to balance conversations off of, especially before you actually get into an interview. And it depends on how you do it. Like if you do an interview separately and then go back and do the intro, you have a little more time to banter without the guest awkwardly staring at you, which we've, we've kind of done it both ways. It just depends mm -hmm. on how much time we have. And if you have the right co-host, like it, it, the dynamic can be amazing. And that was what we had. Like it was, it was awesome. Like he, he is such a different personality for me and he's super goofy. I'm very much like, get to the point, you know, like, yeah. and I'll say that to him and it's, and it's kind of like the, the like mean person, innocent person kind of vibe. And it works really well as long as I don't take it too far and get too mean, you know, but those are like, that's the good part of it. You know, that it, it's, it helps so much at the beginning, especially. And then we can talk about the negatives of it if you want, but that's, that's the good side of, of having a co-host. Yeah, I mean, so what what would be a, a negative maybe of having a co-host, and then you know, not just what the negative is. How how would you go about trying to avoid that, whatever that negative yeah. would be? Uh, I mean, there's so much to it, but like, just think of it like a marriage, you know, like, or just not even a marriage, but like just a, a romantic relationship where it's like you, things can be going really well until they're not, and when they when they stop going well, it's it can be really hard to bounce back from that. Things can get in between the relationship that are outside of just a normal episode, right? Like on, on mic, we're great, but outside of it, it just wasn't so great when it comes to like workload. And then there can be like resentment around people doing all the work with, with, without like any help, you know, um, there can be some, some issues on my, like on my end, like I tend to be a mean personality. So like Chris is a sweet dude. Like he is a super sweet guy and I'm not going to like air dirty laundry here or anything, but like things that he did triggered me in ways that made me not a good person. And, and things Chris was going through made him not a great person for the podcast. So it just got to the point where like, we are, we are better off as friends than we are as co-hosts on a podcast. You know, like there's a point where it's just, you have to make the decision where are, are you both better off without each other? And like, I think you've all, we've all been through, if you've, if you've dated a lot, I mean, I'm married now, so this is not a thing that I, that I have to deal with thankfully anymore, but like, if like you're dating someone and it just kind of goes downhill and you just realize like, we're both better off without each other. Like we should split this off. You know, we're not, we're not helping each other be better people at this point. Then that's the, that's the point where it's probably time to split things up. So, um, but this, I guess that's really all there is to say, like at a certain point, it gets really hard to salvage a friendship when there's bitterness between you on mm -hmm. a personal level, Yeah, especially when there's like reliability issues that triggers like meanness on one side. And like, it's just, it's just a, an unhealthy dynamic. So I, I just didn't want to, to deal with that anymore. I mean, you guys are always saying, or you were always saying you got to work on your business, not just in your business. And it's the same with marriage and, and friendships. Probably you need to work on your marriages as, as well as just existing in them. So do you think there's anything that maybe you could have done differently or, or I, I'm sure that you're not like just sitting there harboring resentments and not saying anything about it to him? No. So I'll, I'll say this is to, to be honest is like the quote I've always heard is this is, this is for employees, not co-hosts. Like this is like, I looked at him as like a partner, not like yeah. a, just an employee. But the, the quote I've always heard is that the, the day you, f you feel like you need to fire somebody is the day you should fire somebody. <laughs> so it's like the, the gap between the day you realize you need to fire somebody to the day you actually do it. That's, that's all on you as a business owner. And so like the eight month gap that we didn't have a podcast is probably where the hard conversation should have ha happened. And it was me trying to basically be a great friend and help of another friend through a like a, a tough time he's going through and not yeah. just split things off, not trying to abandon somebody. Like I, I don't ever want to be that person, but at a certain point, man, everybody has, everybody has a tipping point, man. So I, it's just, yeah. All right. Back to your podcast. How, how big is your podcast? Like how, how many listens, downloads, you said something like maybe tens of thousands of subscribers. I feel like your podcast is enormous. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, like it depends on what your definition of enormous is. Because if you look at YouTube channels, like okay, well, I've we have had, over a million downloads. I've had three hundred listens so far. Okay, so baby podcast. <laughs> Hopefully, we can we can rook up, we can pump up those rookie numbers uh, when this episode yeah. comes out. I'll promote this. Yeah. If it, if the edit's good, we'll see. We'll see if the edit's good or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, so yeah, we're over a million downloads. I don't have the specifics because I don't really track it anymore because yep. we moved platforms from um from libsyn to megaphone when we did the rebrand that was part of of the the transition and it's just such a way better platform but i only i only know the ne the numbers on megaphone at this point but if you look at like a, a podcast with a million downloads 
that's like an extraordinary number to hit, like a milestone that, that not many, very few podcasts actually hit. But if you look at like a YouTube channel, a million's nothing. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I have a million views on YouTube between my couple of YouTube channels and I am nothing on YouTube. <laughs> so like, it just depends on what your threshold is. But I, I will say a, a podcast listener, it is many, many multiples more valuable than an email subscriber or a YouTube subscriber. So mm -hmm. I know what our earnings per lead is on email. I know like re relatively what a value, the value of a YouTube subscriber is. And I know the value of what our podcast listener is. And it is like, it's an order of magnitude larger on the podcast listener side. Yeah. YouTube is a whole different game. I have a, uh, a cruising YouTube channel where my wife and I have a, a vlog there. There's, I see your face. You don't know what this is. There's a whole world in YouTube about people who go on cruises like carnival, Royal Caribbean, cruises and they they make vlogs about those cruises huh. and uh my wife and i took a cruise in 2019 and we put some videos up it was like seven videos i have almost 65,000 views on those seven videos <laughs> you came out at the wrong time too because a year later nobody's <laughs> taking cruises i know but that's i know that's a, that's a fun niche to be in i mean because like um i bet there's a lot of sponsorship opportunities around that because it depending on what sort of content you're putting out, your monetization engines are completely different. Like I will yeah. not take sponsors as long as I can handle on six figure creative or the six figure M studio. We actually turn down every sponsor we've ever offered, but for something like a cruise YouTube channel, that's probably the only great way to monetize. That. Yeah. No, we, we had, we had planned on taking more trips the following year, but you know, December, 2019 is when, when the last one was, and then uh, things fell to hell. Well, I've never been on a cruise, so maybe I have what? to watch your stuff, see if you can convince me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my I'm a, God. I'm an adventure traveler, man. Like, I've been to Thailand yeah. multiple times, Europe multiple times, Iceland, like, maybe going to South America this year. I like going places and building experiences. If I want to relax, Cancun was kind of it. Yep. I know a cruise is, like, just a different bit. You're, like, there to relax. So and, here's like, – this is out. kind of a, a combination, maybe. We're going on one in June. This is our 10-year our wedding anniversary. We're going to – Congratulations, Thank man. Thank you. Thank you. You will have already been on it by the time this episode airs. I will. So talk about it as if it's the past. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going on a, a cruise around the Norwegian fjords. Beautiful. Yeah. That'll be amazing, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Me and my wife almost went on one instead of Cancun this year, but it was just like, it just didn't work out. We, were, we just know what Cancun would have been like because we did it last year, the exact same trip, and it was exactly what we needed it to be at the time for recovering from burnout. Yeah. All right. Well, so if, if you're listening now and you want to check out the cruise channel, it's Cookley's Cruising on YouTube. Maybe there's a Norwegian Fjords video up at this point. I don't know. Uh, anyway, your podcast, if you were, if you were going to grow a podcast, like from scratch, you have a million downloads. Now you're on megaphone. Surely you've learned some things about growing a podcast. How would you grow a podcast if you're going to start one today? Brand new. Yeah, so you had said something earlier about paid ads, but is is that the way that you would go? No, 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 not not to start out. So me personally, since my podcast is like on expertise that I have, um, I would be launching the podcast from scratch, exactly how I'm doing it. But I I have an email list. <laughs> I have tens of thousands of people on the email list. Well, let's pretend so you, you have no list. Pretend you have no no uh, list, no okay. audience. You're like from scratch. Brand new yeah. to the game. So as long as I still have my expertise, if I still have my expertise, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a podcast tour. Okay. That's the first thing I'm going to do. So I'm going to try to get on other people's podcasts. I'm going to reach out to podcasts that interview people like me. And I'm going to have pre done like topics that I can talk about, like that I can just bring it to me and I can talk about it. So for me, that'd be like funnels, list building. It would be like paid advertising. It could be, um, sales, premium pricing. There's like all sorts of topics that I can just, you, I can talk for you for hours on and I can bring those topics to a host. And as someone who is interviewing guests right now, I'll tell you right now, if you match the podcast perfectly from a topic perspective, you have the expertise and authority that they look for as, as a, as a, as a podcast and you come to them with the perfect topics, like you've saved that person a lot of trouble to find a good guest with good, uh, good background. So the hardest one would probably be the first podcast. So you may struggle a little bit there, but you could probably get on, on a newer podcast without much struggle and use that as a portfolio piece to get on these other podcasts. Yeah. Um, 
I would probably try to be have a podcast out beforehand because the good thing about going on a podcast tour is everyone listening already listens to podcasts. Right. So then I would say, by the way, if you want more to connect with me or listen to more about this sort of topics, this is all I talk about on the Six Figure Creative Podcast. Just go to sixfigurecreative.com. That's the number six figurecreative.com to learn more about that podcast. And that would be my, my call to action at the end. I wouldn't do lead magnets or anything. I would just try to get people to listen to the podcast. So no, no special gift for the listeners of this other podcast. I put this special special together just for your audience. That can be an effective thing. Like I did that on a podcast that I was on called nail the mix. And I sent them to a specific URL and like over the years I've gotten I don't, at least hundreds, if not over a thousand leads from that one interview I did. And because I had the specific URL with like yeah. links to what we talked about and, and so on and so forth. And it was, it was a really well, good way of doing that. But that I knew the size of that podcast at the time. So it was worth doing, but you know, if I'm going a podcast tour, I'll have something set up ahead of time where I can systemize the process of that. But for this episode, I don't have anything prepared if you're wondering. No, no, I don't. <laughs> and then what about your current podcast? How are you, how are you driving growth to your current podcast? Yeah. So there is what we are planning to do and what we are actually doing right now. The only thing we're really doing is we put out weekly episodes and we try to interview guests that have a great story. Some of the guests have good followings. And when those guests promote, we get a really good boost in, in uh, subscribers and listeners. And that goes on after the fact pretty well. Uh, and then long-term str growth strategy is taking some of the episodes that I think are incredible, especially in these other niches that we don't have experience or background in like photography, videography, and some of these really cool stories and then running ads to them. Example is we have, um, we have a photographer making six figures plus a year doing like corporate photography and no one really knows who he is. He's like a known name. Like, I mean, he's not a, he doesn't have a brand attached to him or anything. Yeah. So running ads to that for photographers will attract more photographers to listen to that episode to hear how he's, he'll, he, how he built that business. We have a videographer we brought on episode 152, uh, An Anthony Crapperati, I think is his name. And he has uh video lyric vids.com. And that's like, that was a great episode. I don't want to misquote, but like, high six figure, yeah. multiple high six figure, maybe low seven figure a year business as a videographer and, uh, or animator. And that will, I know will do well. Cause that's one of our most downloaded episodes. So running ads to that, we'll bring in more of the video crowd. And then, um, the same for design. We had, uh, a pretty large designer or a couple actually Andy J pizza on the podcast, which is like a huge podcaster and designer. And then, uh, Lisa Congdon on the podcast. And she is another huge designer and she, she actually took her designs and, and, put it on uh, physical merchandise and has partnerships and, and licensing deals and online store and her own printing fulfillment center. And like, so she's taken her skills a completely different direction as a designer. And I know that's going to appeal to a lot of designers out there to see how she does that. So I know that when I put the ads out there in front of those people, we'll start attracting more of those people, but I just haven't, haven't done that yet because I'm still working on a lot of the, the bottom of funnel and business model side of six figure creative. And I feel like until I have that dialed in, I don't want to spend money on ads for this business right now. To that point, what what is the bottom of the funnel look like? What, what's what's the goal with the six figure creative? I know that you have the um some so you have some lead magnets that you've talked about in the past, but like you're mm -hmm. building a podcast, you have a, a huge audience. What are you selling? Like what's the how do you, how are you making money with the podcast? How do you monetize it? So, two software products right now. One is the website builder, and average lifetime value of a customer for that is like let me do the math really quick. Point which if anyone has a software company, just take your average revenue per user, your average monthly revenue per user, divide it by your monthly churn, which is a percentage. And that gives you your lifetime value. So it's around seven to 800 bucks, a lifetime value of a customer on, on easy funnels. So for every customer I get on easy funnels from our podcast, that's 800 bucks in the bank, long-term file pass. File pass is another software subscription uh, company specifically for recording studios. We don't necessarily have plans right now to, to expand that out, but it's a similar kind of LTV for that. Um, so those are two, two bottom of funnel things that I have going on. But the biggest thing for me right now is the new coaching program that I've rolled out kind of behind the scenes mm -hmm. for creatives. And we have a couple like what I call pilot groups going through that right now. And it's a year long program. I have one that's wrapping one cohort that's wrapping up their year uh, next month. And then I have another one that just started their year, you know, in the last three or four months. And that's been going extraordinarily well. And I'll probably be scaling that up by the time we get this episode aired. But that's kind of my big flagship thing. I'm not doing courses or I don't have plans to do courses. I've done courses in the past. The problem with courses is people have all the intentions to implement. They buy, they're excited. And then you only have like a, a small percentage, 10, 20%, if that completion rate. And all the people that completed the videos, even fewer, 
actually implemented. So the way I have the coaching program set up is this very much like high touch. You have assignments and due dates, you have accountability, you have like things you're actually getting shit done. So like of all the students I've had that I've have one right now, that's kind of ghosted. And we actually have a, a, we're building out me and my sister are building out a follow-up process for ghosted students so that literally no one gets left behind. So like everyone's completed the stuff, they've done the work except for this one damn student. And we're going to get him back in and, and involved in everything for his year. But yeah, it's, it's such a better experience for them. It's a better process. It's like, it's just in, in better outcomes for everybody. So that's, that's the way I'm building this business is more, more of a coaching focus. So that, that's kind of the, the business model of Six Figure Creative. Who is your ideal coaching client, I guess? Who, like, are they starting a business? Are they starting a podcast? Are they, do they already have a business? I want our free content to be more than good enough for anyone just starting out. So like uh, when I start scaling the coaching program up, I'll roll the YouTube channel back out, putting out weekly videos there because I did that for like six months. And then I pulled back because that was no longer the bottleneck. Top of Funnel was not a bottleneck. It was more fulfillment. So now we've kind of getting fulfillment dial in. And when that's fixed, I'll go back to Top of Funnel doing more around YouTube. But I want the YouTube content and the mini courses and resources that I give away and the content episode, the weekly episodes of the podcast to be more than enough for beginners. And then for the coaching program, I want people that are like at least 20, 30, 40, preferably 50,000 a year right now that are looking to scale to six figures. The problem with when you have a complete beginner who takes advantage of a coaching program, I say take advantage, like joins a coaching program, tries to take advantage of what we offer. They're just not, it's like trying to teach marathon running to a toddler. They're just, they don't have the legs strength to do it. You know, they're like, maybe we can get them like a little faster, a little cardio, but they're, they're still toddlers, you know, like they, they don't, they're not big enough, strong enough to take advantage and do a full marathon themselves yet. So it is better off that they consume these other resources. Maybe we'll have some variation of it for the newer people. That's a little less intense, but trying to put them into this coaching program would, would probably do more harm than good at this point. So we're, we're going for people that are already at least part-time and then, um, looking to scale to six figures through like setting up things like lead acquisition or lead generation, setting up the biggest thing that I've seen, by the way, is people that have terrible business models. And they can't price appropriately because they're offering such a pitiful outcome for people. Yep. And as freelancers, they're like, buy my service. And they don't realize that no one buys a service, they buy an outcome. So I work with them and like reshape how they're selling their things, how they're packaging and pricing things. And once that business model is tied in, then you can actually start pouring fuel on the fire and then grow that to six figures. But most people stagnate around the twenty to $50,000 a year range because they don't even have that core piece figured out. So that's kind of the, the ideal person for that. And if, if anybody listening to this feels like they would fit into that avatar, I guess. Is there anywhere that you would like to send them? Uh, yeah. So sixfigurecreative.com, which is the um, number sixfigurecreative.com slash apply. I believe as of right now, that will take you to the application for the coaching program. It's application only. I reject, I say around maybe more than 50% of applicants. And then of the people that I talk to on the phone, I, I reject a about 40% of those, because to me, it has to be a, a perfect fit. Cause it's a long-term thing. Like I, it's, I look at it more like a relationship than I do more than anything else that I've ever sold because it is very much like high touch. And I don't want, I don't want either bad apples in, or I don't want to, someone to pay to get in. That's like a bad fit and it's not going to be good for them. And then they either fall off or don't, don't get the, the result that they wanted. So a very, very, uh, selective of who I led into the program. You have a company Good Fortune Media that helps businesses set up podcasts. You know, I, I have a, a company and a, a business budget and I want to make a podcast. I would come to you and say, help me, help me make that podcast. Do you have any thoughts about expanding to other podcasts yourself? Or are you going to make a podcast for Good Fortune Media or <laughs> is, yeah, is so, Six Figure Creative it for now? Yeah. Yeah. Good Fortune Media's ultimate content marketing engine would be a podcast. Like how would you market a podcast agency, podcast production agency, any other way than through podcasting? <laughs> like it'd be, it'd always be like sacrilegious. Um, although there are some, I've seen like a couple of people, like there's a YouTube uh, platform where they coach YouTubers, but their main content marketing play is actually podcasting, which is hilarious to me, but it's because their ideal listener is a podcast person who is struggling on YouTube and long form content just works better on podcasting. So there is some sort of like play where sometimes the thing that you create yourself isn't the best medium for marketing. So I don't feel too sacrilegious there if I did something else, but yeah, back to your question, good fortune media, the whole idea behind that is just creating a service that takes 
everything off the hands of the business owner, because as a business owner myself, I'm incredibly busy. I don't have time at this point to launch a podcast from scratch. So in figuring out all the processes, all the gear, all of the like set up for the website. So we, we created a, an agency that does that all that for them. And it's very expensive, but our ideal client for that is someone who's already earning half a million to 5 million a year that already has preferably an email list and is already spending money on paid advertising, but hasn't gone into the, the podcasting world yet. Maybe they have a YouTube channel. Maybe they have a blog. Maybe they have some of these other areas, but they haven't launched a podcast. That's the perfect client for us because they have the budget to actually afford what they need and want, which is like full service podcast production. We want it. We, we've set things up so that all you have to do is onboarding call. We get all we need. You do approvals. And then you start showing up the microphone with your engineer recording episodes with guests or without guests, however you want. And uh, that's kind of the, 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 the process bef behind that. And eventually, if I do want to, if I ever do want to launch other podcasts specifically for Good Fortune Media or things for Six Figure Creative that are more niche specific, like we did for Six Figure Home Studio with their own co hosts, not me doing it, then Good Fortune <laughs> Media will be who we use for that. <laughs> you're, so you're, you're a one podcast and, and that's it right now. One, one podcast. Yeah, I for see, you. I, I see all these guys who have like, three or four podcasts and i'm just yeah. like how do you do that like i i can't i can't even imagine it it's yeah my podcast takes up so much mental bandwidth right it doesn't take much time but just mental bandwidth especially going through the struggle we went through the last like year for the rebrand and like dragging our heels for everything i'm like oh so i don't necessarily want more podcasts right now <laughs> all right uh you've taken a stand on your podcast a couple of times well not a couple of times primarily that um at least as far as in the six figure home studio world, it's not about the gear that you use. Like a new microphone isn't gonna grow your business in the studio. Um, and you've even gone so far as to put an alert that plays when a brand name is mentioned, which you you call a, a, a gear alert. <laughs> we call it the gear lust alert. Yeah. It used to have a, a naughtier name, but yeah. we've 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 uh, we've grown and adapted as adults. So the gear lust alert is what we called it uh, as of episode the last episode it was on where, where did that mentality come from how can somebody who's caught in the clutches of gas or gear acquisition syndrome break free from that yeah so like i've never had gas gear acquisition syndrome my whole background was in audio and it was starting a studio in my parents basement and i grew up to six figures with less than twenty thousand dollars a gear and that includes like my desk that includes like all my microphones that includes my preamp my interface my computer like it was everything like six figures plus a year with $20,000 a year. So I, I knew, and whereas most studios, like especially commercial studios are like millions in gear in facilities. So they build out these crazy spaces. So I knew you didn't need it from experience. So when I launched a six figure home studio, every single other podcast in the audio space talked heavily on gear. So I wanted to be, again, I wanted to zig wherever else is ags. I want to be the person who's in the blue ocean. So from day one, I don't actually, I don't know when the first instance of the gear lust alert came up, but it was pretty early on. But from pretty much day one, we had a policy of no gear talk on the podcast because at no point should a piece of gear be mentioned because that has no impact on your business. There are maybe a couple instances where you could make a business conversation around gear, especially when it's talking about reinvesting money into gear or something like that. But those were so few and far between that they rarely ever showed its face, like a legitimate reason to talk about gear on the podcast. Now, that was actually another reason why our, our, uh, my co-hosts, and I personalities did so well together because he was an absolute uh, gear fiend yep. and I was not. So like he'd be the one that would always get the gear lust alerts and I would always make fun of him for it. And it was just kind of that fun push pull kind of yeah. thing that we had going on. So he was very much like the good cop. I was the bad cop and it worked really well. So, but yeah, that's, that to me is like anyone should take that. Like if there's something that your audience like swears by that you believe is absolutely pointless, make it a point to take a stand to push back against that because polarity like that always does something to invoke a response from people. And I would much rather have a response from somebody than to be utterly uh, unfazed by anything that I say, do, or talk about. <laughs> that's why like polarity done correctly can really help a podcast grow. Yeah. I think that's a, a great point and certainly uh, an apt place maybe for us to start wrapping up. What's, what's one of the most important lessons that you've learned about podcasting since you started? Uh, the only thing that matters is consistency. <laughs> uh, like if you looked at our growth numbers, we, even with a, a good email list, we only started with like, I said, we only started, we started with like a few thousand listeners, uh, per episode. <laughs> it was like pretty decent, like maybe a couple thousand, a few thousand per episode, which is like, 
it takes so long for the average podcast to get there. So like, yeah. I don't want to play down those numbers, but we've never had a giant spurt in growth. We've never had a huge standoff episode that did like 20, 50, 70, whatever thousand downloads. Like, I don't know how many you, you hear some of these where you'll have like a good steady number and then some guests will blow it. We never had that. Mm-hmm. We never had a YouTube interview blow up and do a million views on YouTube or anything like that. It's just been a very slow, steady growth month after month, year after year, a couple dips here and there where we slow down and then we kind of rise back up. So it's like the only thing that I could say is if you are not committed to a hundred plus episodes, then a podcast is not for you. I, I will say at the very beginning when we launched it, we said we were just testing things out. We were doing a few episodes to see if the interest was there. And if the interest was there, we would keep pushing forward. But that was more of a ploy to get uh, response, feedback, reviews from people. I think we wanted like 50 reviews or else we weren't going to continue the podcast. <laughs> and I think the first week we had like 75 reviews. Nice. Which helped a lot, honestly, moving forward. But we were honestly committed to do more than that if, if need be. And, uh, and I think you have to have that long-term approach. And, and just talking to you, Chris, as a, as a new podcaster, it seems like you've got good things going on here where you've got like enough in the pipeline where I'm not coming out for like a couple months. So that's good. And interviews, typically the way you're doing them now are a lot easier than trying to come up with your own content every damn week. So, but if you, if you keep going long enough, you'll find, you'll find out exactly like what you're trying to work towards, what your audience is, what your voice is, what your, what's your shtick's going to be. Yep. And it just takes time to develop your personality as a podcaster. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, if you go, do you have show notes, Chris? Uh, so I, I did a transcript for the first couple of episodes and it, it was, uh, super painful. I do have a page on my website for each episode and I have links that we mentioned throughout and there's a, a link to the YouTube version, but good. So I'll say this. First of all, tr- transcripts all automated. Just use Descript. It's automated. Do not edit it. Put it on your show in a scroll box. So it doesn't have the whole page taken up in the, in the move the fuck on. Don't, don't yeah. do a, an actual like perfect transcript. That's awful. We, and we put on there, this is unedited. It's just for yeah, no, you. I, for I had something like this. that on there. Yeah. But, uh, okay. It, but it's... I was going to say, I want you to link if you can on your show notes page, I'll give you the link to my first YouTube video that I actually spoke. And if you hear the troglodytes voice, that you hear, which is a cave dwelling <laughs> creature, by the way, like a caveman, the prehistoric caveman that you see on that video and hear is not the, the like overly confident kind of sassy voice that you hear now that came from very, very many repetitions of doing a podcast every week, YouTube videos, lives that I've done. Like it's a very, it takes a long time to hone a decent personality. And I am still like nowhere near some of the people I look up to as podcasters and, 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 um, influencers, if you want to call them that educators, right. speakers, like some of these people are incredible. And I know it's a long journey for me to move forward, but I hope that anyone who is like, I don't have the voice for this. Or yeah. I don't have the personality for this at least listens or watches that video on YouTube that will be on your show notes page. What's the URL for that, Chris? Uh, that'll be who makes a podcast.com slash E 15. E15. Yeah, E-1-5. go there and then right. he'll have it embedded or he'll have uh, a link to it. Watch that and that'll give you a little encouragement that you can go from that to this. It is a massive improvement. <laughs> but that that was uh I think that video is like 12 or 13 years old. So it's a, a long process. Pat Flynn recently did something similar to that. He uh, he shared one of his very first YouTube videos or or podcast recordings, I think it was. And yeah, it, it's it's kind of shocking to see how far people come by the time you find them usually. You know, they're well into it. Is there anything else that, that we should talk about? Did we miss anything that you wanted to cover? I know we only have a couple minutes here left. I mean, we there's way more to talk about because... I know. I have a million questions that we did not get a chance to get to, as is as is the way things go for me. Yeah. Well, maybe I can be, maybe I can be your first repeat guest at some point. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll come back on. We talk about more. But there's, I mean, there's so much more. Like Podcasting is a beautiful medium with so much opportunity. And you can go so many different directions, whether you're trying to make a business-focused pod, focused podcast like mine, or you're trying to create some sort of like viral sensation like Serial or whatever other stuff is out there, or a comedy podcast, sports podcast. Like You can go so many different directions. And you can take influence from all these different kinds of podcasters. But this is like, this is like an endless journey. So if I were Chris and I was looking for a way to monetize this podcast, I would have a membership site because a membership site is great for something like this, where you have so much long-term learning and education and things to try and adapt and people to connect with and learn from. Uh, But that's what I would do, Chris. (laughs) More to come, more to come. (laughs) Um, All right, Brian, where can people find you? If you if you're trying to launch a podcast yourself, go to goodfortune.media and book a call with me. We can chat about it. And uh, that's assuming that you are 
an established business and you're not a brand new, like no money to your name because Good Fortune Media is not cheap. And if you are a freelancer or you just want to hear my podcast, go to sixfigurecreative.com. That's the number sixfigurecreative.com and all the information's on there. All right. Brian Hood, thank you so much for coming on Who Makes a Podcast. I had a lot of fun. This was super informative and I really enjoyed this. Dude, thanks for having me. That was my conversation with Brian Hood, entrepreneur, business educator, and host of the Six Figure Creative Podcast, which can be found on all of the major podcast networks. You can also find Brian at sixfigurecreative.com, and that's the number six. My name is Chris Cookley, and you can find me at whomakesapodcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, it would be an enormous help if you shared it with your friends or left a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. It really does make a difference. And if you host a podcast and would like to be my next guest on Who Makes a Podcast, please let me know. Go to whomakesapodcast.com slash guest and tell me about your show. This is Who Makes a Podcast. I'll be back next time with another conversation with another incredible podcast host. Thanks for listening.